What's up, everybody? Welcome into another edition of the Sit Down, a Crime and Mafia podcast. I am Jeff Nadu. Welcome back in. Hope you're enjoying your day. We're back here uh, week two. Uh, week one was great. Really enjoyed doing the show on Vincent Giganti. It was a good success. People liked it. People enjoyed it. Uh, we're back here for another episode. They didn't shut us down. Uh, we're back uh, and we got a great topic today. Uh, we're going to talk Nikki Scarfo, uh, one of the biggest lunatics in the history of Cosa Nostra and organized crime. We got a great guest to talk to. Uh, as always, make sure you subscribe uh, to the show. If you're on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you're listening, make sure you follow us on Twitter at the sit down seven. Uh, let's get started. Uh, as I said, great show last week. Let's follow it up with number two here. Uh, joining the show is a Nikki Scarfo expert. We had to bring him on. Uh, I guess he's turned into a bit of a friend. Scott, I would say you're a friend at this point. Yeah, buddy. Uh, I consider you a colleague and a contemporary and someone that I uh, admire in what you do and how Thanks, you do man. it. And you got you got some class. You got flair. You got knowledge. What's uh, it's, a, it's a perfect combination. That voice you're hearing is uh, none other than the great uh, Scott Bernstein, the author of Mafia Prince. I had to get Scott on because Scott wrote the book along with Philip Leonetti on uh, Philip Leonetti's life. If you're aware of the mob, Philip Leonetti was the nephew of Nikki Scarfo. And when I mentioned this to Scott, I, I kind of assumed we had to get Scott on. Scott's a historian. He's an organized crime expert, does some great work uh, on all sorts of different websites. He's the owner of the Gangster Report, uh, does some great stuff, w was a, a kind of a counsel and a, a consultant on uh, movies. You're an expert on Detroit, uh, Ma the Detroit Mafia, Scott, right? Uh, you yeah. did some stuff with uh, White Boy Rick and all sorts of different things. Yeah, I, uh, I consider my coverage district. I mean, I'm from the Midwest, um, grew up in Detroit, spent a lot of time in Chicago, cut my teeth, um, you know, in the world of uh, learning about organized crime, actually in Chicago, working for the Illinois Attorney General's office uh, out of law in law school. Uh, working Chicago mob cases and that really sparked my interest. This was in the early 2000s and um, was able to publish uh, my first two books on Detroit, and Chicago. And uh, then, you know, George Anastasia had always has always been a, um, you know, kind of the blueprint for how I wanted my career to go. And uh, I called him up when I was in law school and, and kind of asked him to let me be his protege. And, um, he's just he was always there for me and and guiding me and uh his writing was was very inspiring to me and really was eager to to dip into the uh world of writing about philly mob but i had no connections or ties to the city or other than george um but uh, george kind of brought me into the fold and uh uh showed me around and introduced me around and and when the opportunity to write phil uh phillips book came up um, in the early 2010s, it was just a dream come true. And uh, it's it's my uh, so far in my career, I would say in the first, you know, decade and a half uh, off of the, you know, out of the gate. That's my magnum opus. That's my you know signature um, book. I've written six, but that's the one I'm most proud of and um, was really excited to be able to tell the story of the Philadelphia mob in the 1980s. And um, and then it just I kind of used it as a as a, um, a stepping stone or a kind of a, 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 a pole vault, if you will, into writing about uh, modern day Philadelphia stuff. And I love doing it. It's my, uh, <laughs> it's my favorite place to, to write about. And I love South Philly. I love, uh, I love the, the Philadelphia area and I get in there as much as I can. And it's, uh, I, I, I'm honored to be on here and talking about this stuff. Yeah, obviously, uh, if you know me, you know, I'm from the area. I lived in Philadelphia for many years. I lived in the exact neighborhood that uh, that that all these guys are, are from. And uh, yeah, if, go check out the book, Mafia Prince, Inside America's Most Violent Crime Family in the Bloody Fall of Cosa Nostra. And then you can actually also see Scott, big time Scott Bernstein on uh, White Boy, which is currently on Netflix. Uh, the story of uh, White Boy Rick and the one of the biggest mischaracterizations of justice in the history of this country. Uh, make sure you go check that out. How about that, Scott? We can see you on screen as well. Yeah. So I've done a handful of documentaries over the last decade. Um, this one is obviously shot off like a rocket in the, another galaxy in the last week. Um, it's, it was really, uh, in addition to making my bones, if you will, as a crime reporter, reporting on organized crime, 
you know, the Italians, the Italian mafia um, here in Detroit, they're in a, <laughs> in a lot of other major cities, including Philadelphia. There was a, you know, a pretty uh, high octane urban drug world uh, that has a real rich history here in, in Michigan. And um, one of the most fascinating figures from that urban drug world, uh, opposed to uh, everyone that he was in you know in that world with who was black uh rick was white and he was a teenager and he was only 14 15 years old uh and was running around with all the biggest dope bosses in detroit that were all black and twice his age and you know the, the scene if you can picture it would be like you know superfly uh driving around in a mercedes would leave it to beaver you know in his in his passenger seat um and uh well people didn't really know outside of that very um, tabloid friendly case that was that was kind of here and there for a second in the late 1980s and then disappeared because he was in prison. Uh, and then I came on the scene in the mid 2000s, started writing about it and and was able to uncover the fact that he was actually a, a, a bought and paid for a, a creation of the U.S. government and had been recruited right out of eighth grade uh, to work uh, for a federal drug task force and put into uh, the Detroit black underworld to infiltrate drug gangs and was in, was encouraged to drop out of high school. And then when they got all the information from them, they could, and they busted the biggest drug boss in Detroit because of the information Rick gave them, they cut him loose. They put him in prison for a, uh, a traffic stop that he had, you know, ran a stop sign in front of his grandma's house. They found drugs. And because of some crazy laws and some crazy political and, and police corruption conspiracies he was doing life in prison without parole um until less than a year ago when he walked out of prison and very proud of uh telling that story and worked on the hollywood film and um the film with matthew mcconaughey came out three years ago nobody saw it because it was frankly uh it, it was pretty bad i actually um, liked it I've, i told you well, i know we I talked actually... about it. i'm glad you liked it some people liked it you know on, on some of the cable networks and where it comes on it gets three stars you know out of the four stars but uh, i was very disappointed in it but uh the documentary i was incredibly proud of i worked on both of them and right now the document the documentary is um uh, is very popular on netflix and yeah and i've always known that netflix was was you know this great equalizer and you know this this probably the most or one of the most influential pop culture tools that exists in the world today but i guess until the doc dropped last week and i kind of got propelled into the eye of the storm i didn't realize you can realize it and then you really realize it mm -hmm. it's like wow just everything went to another level and that thing took off on netflix and was trending for a whole week was in the top at one point it was the number five watch piece of content on the entire platform that uh... it, was, it was heady that was how I felt. I, I remember when I went to Barstool and I, I, we had, I, I created that college basketball podcast. And yep. I remember the first week or two, it was, it was a top 10 podcast on the sports section. And I thought, yep. wow, this is un this incredible. I didn't know I had this ability, but yeah, it's definitely cool. You, you did a great job with it. They did a great job with it. And again, it's definitely not, uh, it's way better than the, the actual film that they put out, but yeah, go check that out. White boy on uh, Netflix, but, but let me, let yeah, me, let me just stuff. real quick, just let the audience know, people that are uh, you know, interested in the Philadelphia mob, uh, there's, a, there's a slight dovetailing or crossover between the white boy Rick story and the Philadelphia mob. Uh, when Rick was locked up in the 1990s, he was cellmates with uh, Crazy Phil Leonetti and Gino Milano. And they actually were um, uh, teammates on a prison baseball team and basketball team that won the uh, that? both won the, the prison championship like circa 93 92 so How about uh, that little connection yeah, what, right back to, to nikki scarfo in a way and yeah and you know insane. again you can't talk about nikki scarfo without talking about philip leonetti and we'll get into philip leonetti just a little bit because he was obviously the protege of, of nikki scarfo let's get into it nikki surrogate, I'd, say surrogate, I'd say surrogate son yeah exactly let's get into it nikki scarfo here on the sit down. Uh, so a couple of main characters we just have to obviously understand. Nicky Scarfo, Philip Leonetti, uh, Angelo Bruno. Obviously, if you've seen a, a movie like The Irishman, you know everything about Angelo Bruno. He'll pay kind of a, a, a part initially in uh, in the Scarfo story. 
Uh, Nikki Scarfo, Nicodemo Dominic Scarfo was born March 8th, 1929 in Brooklyn. And he was born right before the depression, basically. So we actually have to remember that the roaring twenties were coming to an end and the depression was about to begin. Uh, Nikki actually, his father was a, a mobster. Uh, he kind of deserted the family when he was a kid. Uh, Nikki's mother decided, well, she's going to move to Philadelphia. She had family in Philadelphia. They moved down to the city. Uh, and at 12, uh, they head on down. Uh, he kind of worked, did his thing, was still in school. And weirdly enough, uh, Scott, in 1947, when Nikki graduated high school, he was actually voted most talkative in his high school class at Benjamin Franklin High School, which is kind of a weird uh, connection. Uh, well, usually. I mean, the guy, if, if you've studied Nikki, I mean, he's never been someone really to hold his tongue. I mean, no. he was someone that was considerably i mean he wasn't a he wasn't like joey is today uh in terms of you know the media obsession but there was a media obsession with nikki and he did engage with the media and he did engage with the cameras so you know I, that I doesn't see, surprise you right so i could see him back as a teenager being pretty talkative because you know i've heard the wiretaps and i've talked to a lot of people that that uh spent time around him and you know there was a lot of stories about him holding court uh uh you know in south you know certain south philly eateries and in, in atlantic city uh some of the hot spots there and just kind of having a whole table of of soldiers and capos and telling stories and busting balls and um he was someone that uh you know i don't think he was he wasn't a uh gaudy like i said he wasn't a gaudy or a joey but he was the step right below that yeah he definitely wasn't uh you know if a camera was near him he would definitely say something it wasn't like an angelo bruno or somebody like that it yeah. would just kind of fight the camera off uh when he came to philadelphia obviously he had family here his uh, uncles the piccolo brothers were, were in the mob they were made men in the family and you know, as a kid nicky always was a small guy he never liked the fact that he was called little nicky scarfy he never you never call him that to his face he was only about I think five three, five four. He was a little guy. He was a little guy. He would wear he would wear lifts. That that one's yeah, and that doesn't surprise me. He was a little guy. Uh, he hated the nickname, and he actually would fight as a boxer as a young kid. Didn't do real well, so he kind of moved on and joined his uncle Nicky Buck Piccolo in the uh, illegal uh, activity trade in in South Philly. Uh, he bartended, did a little thing, uh, did a little of those kind of things, and attended stuff, and came up under a guy called Joe Rignetta. Joe Rignetta was. A uh, well, con- I, yep. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead, finish. No, he was a consigliere in the family under Joe Ida, who uh, was the boss at the time when Nikki was proposed for membership. Real quick, before we get to your point, Rugnetta was a guy who ran an operation out of a bar on 12th and McKean, right in South Philly. Uh, Rugnetta was kind of an old school guy, uh, and as Nikki was coming up, he kind of took Nikki in as a bit of a not a mentor, but he was around. He was doing things. Uh, Rugnetta had a daughter. Uh, and I guess Rugnetta said, you know what, Nikki, uh, you seem like a guy I would like uh, my daughter to be around. Uh, Nikki kind of uh, shelved the idea and said, no, I have no interest. Your daughter, I don't know if he came out and said she's ugly, but uh, he declined the offer. Uh, and that set uh, Rugnetta off. Uh, and that's kind of where the first, you know, Nikki kind of always, as we said, never held his tongue. Uh, this was kind of the beginning of that. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to undermine your narrative, uh, and I, I definitely could be wrong here, but um, the Rugnetta thing definitely happened. Joe Rugnetta was Angelo Bruno's longtime uh, consigliere uh, and was someone that was upset by Nikki Scarfo's rejection of an offer to marry his daughter, and that, and that actually made Rugnetta want to kill Nikki Scarfo, and he had a uh, that was actually more of a reason that that Nikki left town uh, to Atlantic City more so than the whole famous incident with the, with the stabbing at the at the Oregon Diner. But I would say I wouldn't I personally would not char- characterize Rugnetta as any type of mentor. I think I, maybe Rugnetta... I would say, say I'd say Skinny Razor Tatulio was sure was uh, Nikki's mentor and Nikki worked for Skinny Razor, I think at uh, the Friendly Lounge and yep, uh, yep. and then through Skinny Razor was interacting with Rugnetta. But I don't- I, and I think that's where I'm kind of going. I think Rugnetta yeah. more or less tried to connect just because 
if, if you know anything about Scarfo's background, he's from Calabria. Rugnetto yeah. was from Calabria. And I think Nicky didn't really want anything to do with the guy. Right. So that's like, the, so, you know. I think Rugnetto wanted to mentor yes, Nicky. Exactly. And Nicky didn't want to be mentored by him or upset him to the, or, or, you know, was kind of did a cost benefit analysis and said, well, I'd rather not be mentored by the consigliere if it means I have to marry his ugly daughter. Right, exactly. And at that point, Rugnetta goes, f- gets furious and basically takes as a slight. He's embarrassed. He's disrespected. He wants to kill uh, Nikki Scott. He wanted to kill Nikki for it. Now, again, Nikki had connections. I mean, his uncles were, were made men. Nikki Buck Piccolo basically says, no, it's not going to happen. But around this time, uh, Nikki's down at the Argon Diner, down on 3rd and Argon, still there today. They got great French onion soup. Uh, they're in there. They're eating. I guess Nikki gets to a table that's being occupied. The guy that's occupying the table comes over and says, hey, you know, this is my table. I was just speaking to somebody. Nikki becomes incensed, grabs a butter knife, and basically stabs the guy to death. Now, again, I've, I mean, we've all seen knives. We've all seen kitchen knives. It's, I would have to imagine, very difficult to kill someone with a butter knife, uh, but Nikki manages to do so. And somehow, Nikki argues that uh, and he pleads guilty to manslaughter and that it was self defense. He gets about six months in prison, which is wild. Uh, and at that point, as you said, between the Rignetta stuff and 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 the the behavior of Nikki, kind of as a hothead, they send him to Atlantic City. I think I think it was a situation where he, he saw it as a benefit to him to go stake out his own territory, right? Where he could kind of start building this uh, kingdom of crime that that he had envisioned for himself. Um, from talking to Philip, from talking to a number of FBI agents that worked the Scarfo uh, crew, uh, talking to you know the the experts that I look up to in, in the field, I I think it's a a, a fa- uh, I, I think there's some mythology that uh, is more myth than fact when it comes to him relo- relocating Atlantic City. Yes, the the situation. <laughs> at the Oregon diner uh, did not leave him in great standing with Bruno, who was a guy that liked things done quietly and didn't want headlines. And, and Nikki was, you know, had a hair trigger temper and, and could go off uh, at the drop of a dime. And yes, the Rugnetta thing uh, also put him in poor standing, but I, I, I think I, I think I would tell people to be careful with the uh the strict narrative that he was run out of town so it was more of less like uh, and 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 i think i want to kind of real quick set the stage that for anyone that's not from this area atlantic city and south jersey have always been kind of you know let's just say at least recently have been philly territory i think you're kind of basically you're saying that they wanted to kind of revive the city because at the time in the 60s Atlantic City Dead. was a dingy, Dead. yeah, it was a Dead. dingy spot. The Atlantic City was popular back in, you know, in the twenties and the thirties. Back, you know, and some of the, you know, the the early, even like the the Nucky uh, Johnson day, those yep. days, not not in the fifties and sixties. It was basically a, a a junkie, you know, it was a, a yeah, it was a junkie's paradise in a dying resort town that uh, nobody really went to uh, as a. You know, like you're saying, back in the 20s and 30s, it was a big vacation spot. It was a a ritzy vacation spot where people would go there. You know, people that had money would go there. Um, By the 50s and 60s, it was uh, they were were experiencing financial hardships. Uh, I think that the place, the boardwalk itself had become kind of an eyesore. And uh, but all of those factors also make it kind of fertile ground for rackets. Yeah, I mean, no one was there at the time. And I think Nikki, yeah. in a way, kind of looked at it as such. And that's a great kind of way to put it. Uh, in the early 70s, Nikki goes down to Atlantic City, kind of starts up some bookmaking, some loan sharking operations. He was involved in a, a an adult bookstore. Weirdly enough, he lived with his family. They lived in Ducktown, a spot in Atlantic City, right at 28 North Georgia Avenue. And house is still there today. It was a big apartment building. His mother uh, owned it. And uh, they lived there. Uh, his family. Started the construction, construction company. 
Yeah, yeah, and and that's where you know obviously Philip uh, is his nephew was, and uh, the, the whole family was there. And weirdly enough, uh, Nikki's mother, uh, you could kind of tell where Nikki got his personality from because Nikki's mother, in, in certain videos that I've seen, uh, you know, she was a, a, a hothead in her own right. She didn't take any shit from anybody, which uh, you can kind of tell where Nikki got his uh, his 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 fire from. Yeah, he was very uh, close to it. He was very close to his mom, and and in a lot of ways, I think he. Gr- he gravitated towards Philip and Philip, Philip gravitated towards him because they had similar circumstances when they were younger. Philip's father took off. Philip was, uh, you know, I don't want to say a bastard. It's the wrong way to say it, but was, a uh, you know, him and his mom were, were kind of by themselves. And that was Nikki's sister. And, you know, Nikki invited them to, to live with him and the, and, and Nikki's mom and, and, Philip's mother's mom and Nikki became a surrogate father to Philip. Um, at that point, Nikki either didn't have kids or his kids were very young. Um, and, and Philip, uh, became like, uh, an appendage and almost, you know, like if you ever saw Nikki, Philip was right. You know, after Philip graduated high school in the early seventies, uh, from the time he was 18, uh, he was by Nikki's side for the next, uh, you know, 12, 15 years. Yeah. And, and he was kind of, as you said, the, the mainstay next to, to Nikki all the time. Uh, in 71, Nikki meets uh, Nick Caramondi, who was a con man down in Atlantic City, kind of moving rackets and stuff. Uh, they kind of kept in touch. They ran some schemes together. Uh, and in 1972, this is where it kind of starts to get interesting for, for uh, Nikki Scarfo. Um, he's hit with, uh, basically he tries to, arrange a sentence for a cohort of his called Nick Virgilio who had been convicted mm-hmm. in a murder case. Scarfa went to judge Edward Helfon at the time, gave him basically a bribe of $12,000 to reduce Virgilio's sentence. But again, Virgilio gets 12 years, uh, which, so basically the judge never did what he said he was going to do. And that's important to remember because that comes back years later to kind of, uh, kind of ostracize Nikki and Nikki does some things that he shouldn't do. Um, in 1976, obviously, but before before we kind of get into the casino boom, in 73, Nikki gets hit with contempt. Him and Angelo Bruno get hit with contempt. Mm-hmm. Uh, a group of mobsters basically are, are asked to come speak to the, the New Jersey Commission, uh, Crime Commission, about the mob. They all take the fifth and get hit with contempt. They both get sent to Yardville, which is, uh, I, I don't even think it's around anymore. It was a prison right outside of Philadelphia, right over the bridge in New Jersey. I think he gets hit with two years, I want to say. Yeah, uh, and, and it was – go ahead. You can kind of talk about Leonetti. He would go up there and, and visit. Yeah, that's, that was really the the springboard for Philip. And, you know, he jumped into the deep end of the water. Like I said, he was 18 years old. And instead of going to college, you know, he was getting a master's course in, in mob leadership. Um, 18 years old, he's 18, 19. He's ferrying – all of the top lieutenants uh, of, of Angelo Bruno and his uncle uh, from Philadelphia, driving them to meetings, acting as a messenger, uh, taking messages from Nikki Scarfo and Angelo Bruno uh, to the streets of Philadelphia. So, you know, he, he, he was inserted as a pretty integral part to the, the hierarchy of the family right off the bat. And, and that put him really on the fast track, um, for for being groomed to be to be a leader and and when you become a capo and then eventually an underboss uh in your 20s and early 30s um in 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 the modern era of the mafia which i let's just say is you know 1970 forward uh that's that's to this day that's still very rare i mean you're not becoming a uh you know par for the course i would say you're not rising uh up the ranks you know, into you're in your forties or fifties. Right. And, and, and he was rising at 18, 19. And that was something that, as you said, right when he got out of high school, he had been putting in work. He was going up to Yardville. He was taking messages back. He was basically the conduit between Nicky Scarfo and the streets. And, uh, and Bruno, and he was actually um, taking Bruno's wife, mm-hmm. uh, uh, like up there, like was in charge of maintenancing Angela's family. So it was like for a 19, 18 year old, 19 year old kid, he was getting a lot of responsibility and he was showing them that he was capable because he was, he was handling it. Angela's wife loved Philip and, 
you know, in addition to, to bringing all the, the soldiers and, and capos that needed to talk to the, the, the bosses, he was also bringing the wife up there on a regular basis. Nikki would get out. Angela would get out. By 1976, this is where the big time starts to come for Nikki Scarfo. Fortunes change. On November 2nd, 1976, Atlantic City legalizes casino gambling, and the boom begins. Uh, and that's where we'll kind of get into the construction company, Scarf Inc. Uh, but Atlantic City had obviously uh, all sorts of unions at this point. And one of the powerhouse unions was Local 54, Hotel Employees and Restaurant Workers, which is a huge union. Uh, Scarfo had a long time relationship with a guy, Frank Gerace, who was the president of the union. Uh, and basically, Scarfo turns Local 54 into a big time cash cow, starts getting all these uh, payments every month, and and he kind of heads that union, and that's when they kind of create Scarf Inc. Uh, Scarf Inc. Mm-hmm. was a concrete company that, you know, Philip and and Nikki create, and they start doing all the concrete work at all the casinos. The first six casinos in Atlantic City, Scarf Inc. was doing the concrete for. So, again, I mean, at some point, and I'm sure you can answer this. I'm sure at some point, Nikki's dealing with Donald Trump. He's dealing with. Uh, big time developers down in Atlantic City, uh, Scott. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll tell you that um, Donald Trump was doing quite a bit of business with both the Philadelphia mob, not in terms of illegal activity. I want people to understand sure. that, but in terms of uh, contracting for real estate construction and 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 some of the um, properties he was building and developing. Uh, especially in Atlantic City. He was dealing with the Philly Philly guys as well as the Genovese crime family and the Gambino crime family out of out of New York where he was, all of his trades were being controlled by by organized crime. Now, which again, Scott, a, it's important to mention that that's, that was normal back then. Right, I, that's what I was, about, I was about to say. I, so just to give people context so they understand, at that time period, you couldn't do... Yeah, you couldn't be a builder or developer on the East Coast, especially based out of New York City, without you know, without the bulk of your trades being mob controlled. I mean, it just it, it, it wasn't possible. Sure. And, and that's you know important to understand. I, again, we, we heard that during Trump's presidency. Oh, he used to mess with mob guys. Well, everybody did. Right. Uh, so again, the casino boom starts. Casinos being start being built across the boardwalk. It was a great time. Atlantic City was now a, a destination again. Uh, but back into organized crime in 1977, old Joe Rignetta dies. Anthony Caponegro becomes consigliere, and that becomes important because Caponegro becomes a very important figure in Philadelphia mob history around We're 1980. Probably the, but not probably. I would say definitely worst decision that um, Angelo Bruno made. Yes was uh, tapping Tony Bananas as his consigliere, I think thinking that, he, he, here's what was going on at that point. He, Bruno had lost all, pretty much, he was out of touch with, the, with his rank and file. Um, he was isolated and you know, had his inner circle and didn't, really have a desire to interact uh, with his men. Tony Bananas was someone that was a street guy and was a guy that enjoyed being on the street and enjoyed interacting with uh, the rank and file and controlled you know, a big chunk of, of territory in Jersey and was, amb- was ambitious. And I think Bruno saw him as being a conduit to the young guys, the blue collar guys, even, in the, it, it, you know, Nikki Carmondi is, you know, you mentioned him, Nikki Crow. He was kind of in that camp, um, you know, being a conduit to the blue collar guys and keeping those guys happy. Um, in reality, he was just empowering uh, Kappa Negro to put together a coup. And the problem that, Bruno had at this point as well as as you said he was falling out of touch and he was also contradicting himself in many ways yeah, yeah. he was basically saying you you folks in Philadelphia cannot sell drugs directly but but I'm going to take drug money from the Cherry Hill Gambinos and I'm going to and what and Long John yeah and, I, and I'm I'm not gonna you know there was a group called the Rickabinis they were a faction mm-hmm. that was running around in Philadelphia he wasn't taxing them he, he basically didn't want to 
kind of ruffle any feathers and he was just happy. He wasn't taxing them because they were giving him a huge chunk of change every Christmas. Right. But again, right. no one else saw any of that. And right, and right, right. I think yeah. I think he started to ostracize his people. Um now again, Caponegro kind of in a way, he was kind of similar to kind of John Gotti's rise in a way. I mean, he was growing sick and tired of the greedy boss that you know, he just didn't pull it. Gotti pulled it off. He didn't pull it off. Right. The problem. What? Well, he did. He in what? 1980. Uh, let, let's just real quick point this out. We'll, we'll get to 1980 and what happens, to Angelo Bruno. But we mentioned the Scar Inc., the, the concrete company that that they were running down Atlantic City. By that time, they were tied up in Scar Inc., and there was a guy, uh, Vincent Falcone, who began Ooh, to yeah. start talking shit about. Uh, Scarfo and that they did shitty work and, and all this sort of thing. And he was trying to kind of muscle in, I guess you could say. And Nikki Scarfo, as we know, didn't... well, he was, he was, fr- I mean, he was quote unquote friends with these guys. You know, they would, they were socializing together. And when but I think Nikki... behind the scenes, he was probably saying things, right? No, he was. No, that's what I'm saying. So they're, 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 they're hanging around, they're doing business together. And then, you know, when Nikki would be gone or Philip would be gone. Falcone would then start spewing shit talk to the people that were at the bar or at the restaurant. And like you said, was, was was telling everybody that Scarf Inc. does horrible work and shoddy work and, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't use them. Now, Scarfo gets wind of this. And uh, weirdly enough, uh, Vincent Falcone willingly, I guess, because, again, he assumed they were friends. Uh, he didn't know that. They were talking, you know, they, they didn't, I don't he think didn't he know. Knew, I don't think he, knew. Knew. he didn't know that that word had gotten bad. Sure. That, that he had been bad. Had uh, they, been, uh, down talking them. they decided to go to this home in Margate, which is right outside of Atlantic City. And uh, they're at a house. They're having some drinks. And uh, Vincent Falcone turns his back. Philip Linetti takes out a, a pistol and shoots Falcone in the back of the head. Uh, while Scarfo basically calls him a cocksucker and a no good motherfucker. Uh Keep in mind, um, th- there were some other folks there as well. Uh, one of the Merlinos was there and uh, uh, a guy called uh, Joe Salerno, who was a, mm-hmm. a plumbing contractor. Uh, they disposed of the body. Falcone's body's uh, discovered a few days later in a trunk of a car. The problem was they had a witness in all this. Uh, Joe, Joe Salerno Slim. was not yep. a mob guy. He was just a friend. Uh, he goes right to the FBI, basically, or to the police and says, hey, uh, I saw what happened here. Uh, wildly enough in this story, all of them get bail, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, y- usually you don't get bail on murder. They get bail. Uh, and then the trial takes place later, which we'll get to. In 1980, though, this is where the whole thing kind of gets crazy. Angelo Bruno, the boss of the family, is at Dante and Luigi's. He's having dinner. Or no, he's at Cousins Little Italy. I'm sorry, uh, a restaurant in South Philly. He's which driving, became, which became Virgilio's, right? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's driving home. Uh, John Stanfa is the driver of the car, who at the time was just a a driver. Uh, they pull up to uh, Bruno's house, which is still there, Tenth and Snyder, right in South Philly, uh, and a gunman comes up to the back of Bruno and basically double barrel shotgun back of the head. And you'll see the picture. It's, it's floated around on the internet to this day. Uh, basically, Bruno's mouth wide open as he sits there. Uh, now, keep in mind, right before this happens, Stanford rolls the window down. So you have to wonder, was Stanford ever involved in this? We'll never know. I think we he can was. all agree let he me, was. Let me tell you, he was. He was. I have sure. no, no doubt in my mind that John Stanford was part of the conspiracy um, to uh, murder Angelo Bruno, and the only reason he survived uh, the aftermath was because of his tie-ins to the Gambinos and the, and the Cherry Hill group. Now, obviously, there was a lot of issue with the family. The family was sick and tired of of Bruno's stance. But the five families were absolutely furious about this. Giganti, a, a lot of others, they basically th- – this hit was not sanctioned by us. Right. Angelo but Bruno but, was but, pretty powerful, too, at the time. Angelo Bruno sat on the commission. He was – very close to all of the New York Dons. Um, Kappa Negro was, was, was con basically and, and wanted to believe what he was being told, but, but shouldn't have. He, he was convinced by um, Funzi Thierry, who was a front boss for Giganti, 
Frank uh, Thierry, who they all called Funzi, that it was sanctioned. Um, so he he pulled that off with the belief that the commission was behind him. Right. When in fact, Thierry just wanted uh, Bruno out of the picture <laughs> and Testa and Scarfo in the picture because of what's going on at Atlantic City. So let me just back up one second and then I'll take us forward. But I, I just want to say that the, the two big things that people had problems with related to Bruno was a the hypocrisy that was coming out of his mouth when it came to drugs telling everyone that you know they, they couldn't deal or you know the, the whole deal or die mandate when in when in reality he, you know he was getting rich on drug money and then the other side of the then the other issue was in this, in this ties into to the assassination and, and tearing all those guys, and even in some ways the Falcone hit. That the other thing was he wasn't as much as everyone was excited about the casino boom in AC. Bruno wasn't. Bruno saw it as unwanted heat. You know, so Bruno was was kind of slow on the trigger to really embrace what was going on in Atlantic city and was telling people to, to keep their heads low. And it's like, yeah, keep your heads low in one regard, but in another regard, it's like, it's open season there. We can't not go take our piece of it. If we don't take our piece of it, all the New York families are going to come in and take their piece of it. So it became a situation where, you know, Thierry wanted Bruno out of the way because he wanted to get in there with the Philly guys to, to, to get a, a you know, a foothold in, in the, in the casino industry more so than they already were because they felt Bruno was slow rolling it. So Caponegro basically balked, it doesn't balk, but he, he basically understands that, you know, he has the backing, even though he didn't, he kills. And, Tess, uh, he and people killed... should know also that Testa, uh, do we, we haven't mentioned him. Phil, Phil Testa, the chicken man was Angelo Bruno's underboss. Yep. Um, Nikki Scarfo's best friend. And uh, well, Nikki Scarfo's two best friends were Chucky Merlino and and, um, and and Phil Testa. And Testa was taking the pulse of the Capos uh, in the years leading up to the Capo Negro led coup. Um, Testa was taking the pulse of, of the family and, and considering a coup himself so there was a lot of people unhappy with 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 angelo bruno and one of the best anecdotes or i'll give you i want to give you two anecdotes of of things i've heard firsthand uh, that related to things we've just talked about in the last couple minutes first is i think the, the vincent falcone murder really is a microcosm of the lunacy and the egomaniacal bloodlust that that Nikki Scarfo represented and how killing was borderline sexual for him. And I and I'm not using that term lightly. Like he got off on it. And the Falcone murder was a situation where like you said they they lure Falcone to this house and Philip has a, a gun stashed in the freezer of the house and uh they, they say, uh, you know, Vince, I'm going to grab you a drink and I'm going to go get some ice out of the freezer for the drink. And instead of grabbing the ice, he grabs the gun and, and puts two in the back of Falcone's head. And Nikki Scarfo at that point stands over the body and says, God, I love this. I love this so much. I wish I could bring this guy back to life to kill him again. Yeah. And then as the uh, cleanup crew is doing their their duty they had to go get some stuff, I think, uh, to dispose of the body. So, from what I from what I heard from from uh, people that were present, uh, Nikki was left alone with the corpse for like a, a an hour. And when when they got back to load the body in the trunk, he was drunk and and walking around the apartment with a bottle of uh, of Jack. And, you know, cut, you know, he's cutting in water or, and, you know, double fisting and like, was just, was so, you know, it was, it was so happy. He was so thrilled with his work. He had to get drunk with the body. 
Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say was uh, the response of Testa and Nikki Scarfo to those photos that you referenced of Angelo Bruno with his head blown off and his mouth agape, uh, agape was from, from talking to Philip. He said, you know, that night when those, when those pictures were being splashed on the television screen around the, around the world and, and on I, I know, headlines on newspapers around the country, he said that both Nikki Scarfo and Philip were like, that's so, uh, you know, that's so appropriate that his mouth would be up because all the guy wanted to do was eat off other people's plates. He always had his mouth open. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Yeah, that's yeah. something I never knew. Uh, that would make sense. And you, know, you have to feel like they have to feel like they succeeded because everything kind of went the way they wanted to. Bruno was dead. Yeah. Capanegra would be murdered days later by uh, by by New York people. He was discovered in the Bronx with, uh, you know, two in his body, basically. And and he actually had money stuffed up his uh, his, his ass, his backside. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with the intention that he was greedy. By that point, as you said, uh, the commission promote Phil Testa to be the boss of Philadelphia. Tessa Testa promotes um, a scarf for the consigliere and a guy, old school guy, Peter Casella to underboss. Um, and at that point, they're though indicted for murder. Uh, you know, they still get made. They the the books are are opened for Phil Leonetti, uh, Sal Testa, who was Philip's son, and then uh, uh, Wayne Grandy, Sal right. Merlino, and Chucky. But they were all uh, made official members. So yeah, that, everything was some, open. That's something that people should know also that uh, Bruno was hesitant to build up the ranks of the family right. and as a result attrition was taking its toll and the family was shrinking in size and a lot of people you know testa scarfo and in the ilk thought that this was weakening their power and standing you know in the east coast underworld and bruno just really refused to make people i think i think he only had one or two making ceremonies in his like last dozen 50 no, i think he was in power for 21 years and i think he did a, a a handful of making ceremonies right off the bat uh in the early 60s and then they closed the books i think there might have been one that was conducted in the early 70s where uh chicky changalini and uh chicky narducci and um um chicky narducci Ch- uh, chicky changalini and frank sindone got made but uh no young, no young blood was being uh, flushed into the family. So the second that he died, books got opened up, and over the next two, three years, they inducted like twenty-five guys. Yeah, and everything was open. People started defecting uh, out of the uh, Bruno ranks, and either got with it, or uh, you know, basically got down or laid down. Basically, yeah. uh, around this time as well, a guy John McCullough, who was. Uh, the president of uh, the roofers union in Philadelphia started trying to infringe on uh, Scarfo's kind of things that were going on in Atlantic city. Uh, Scarfo asked to, to kill McCullough. McCullough, McCullough was tied. McCullough was tied into the so-called Irish mob in, uh, in right. the K K and a group. The K and a group. Yep. Uh, a hitman goes to his house posing as a delivery man of flowers. He's invited in and, and basically is shot as his home. Uh, in 1981, uh, Philip Tess is actually, though, killed. Uh, and this was kind of a, a crazy hit. Uh, if you've ever listened to some of Bruce Springsteen, you'll hear about the chicken man being killed in Philly tonight. Uh, that was a reference to Philip Tess, who was called the chicken man. Basically, I think it was intended to look like it was from John McCullough's people, though, even though it wasn't. Yeah, it was right. actually from a guy, uh, the guy Peter Casella, who was trying to become boss himself. Uh, he creates a nail bomb. They create a nail bomb put it under Testa's porch. Testa lived in a, a neighborhood called Gerard Estate, which to this day is a really nice neighborhood. It's one of the nice neighborhoods of Philadelphia. It's right around the Gerard Estate, right uh, right over by uh, Passion Avenue, over by the shopping centers now. Uh, it was a really beautiful house. It's still there today, 2117 Porter Street. Uh, he walks into his house, and at that point, there's a remote-controlled detonator across the street. A guy, Rocco Marinucci, presses the button. Chicken and Test is blown up. Uh, and dies uh, they some you know days later find out that Peter Casella was the one that orchestrated this hit uh, crazy enough uh, he's given a pass and shelved yep. they basically tell him to get lost you're out 
uh, your Don and Nikki Scarfo takes over uh, the family at that point. Well, so Casella, um, it wasn't just Casella. So Casella went and aligned with two pretty powerful capos, uh, the Barracuda, Frank Sindone, yep, also known as the Raccoon, uh, and uh, and, and Frank Chicken Narducci, who were both killed as well. Were, were no, well, so to your point, Casella gets the pass, uh, kind of like with John Stanfa, he was very closely aligned with the Gambinos, and I guess uh, Castellano or. Uh, you know, some of the administration um, that were close to Carlo Gambino, who at that point had been dead for four years, but, you know, his cousins were, were still very powerful in Cherry Hill and um, were in the drug, were in the drug business with Casella, uh, you know, got him a pass. He just had to leave town and go down to Florida, but <clears throat> kicking Arducci and, and Frank Sindone were purged as well as uh, Rocco Marinucci and Scarfo takes over and names uh, Philip Acapo names uh, Salvi Testa Acapo and gives Salvi Testa, who was his godson and was um, someone that, you know, Phil Testa and Nikki Scarfo were, were very uh, close. And, you know, when they would speak in private, uh, Testa had agreed that if anything ever happened to Nikki, that, that Testa would take care of Philip and, Nikki had agreed if anything ever happened to Phil, he would take care of Salvi. Um, and Salvi wasn't just made a capo, but he was also assigned the murder contracts of his father's killers. And, mm -hmm. you know, eagerly went about carrying them out over the next year. Uh, and with Marinucci, you know, they killed him and then put firecrackers in his mouth yep. um, to, to symbolize uh, the fact that he had been the one that, that had pressed the button to blow up Phil Testa. And then with, um, with uh, Narducci, I know that Salvi was telling people, you know, I got to be the trigger man and I got to get up close. I want to look him in his eye and pretty much, you know, tell him goodbye myself. Uh, it was very personal. Um, and Salvi did it with a lot of relish. And, and by that point, he had become kind of an accomplished hitman. It was his father. Yeah. He, he wanted to feel it. And uh, he definitely did. You also mentioned he becomes a capo. Same with uh, Philip Leonetti. And um, he had he, he had the charisma that his dad didn't have. He, I yeah. mean, people people lo liked and respected Phil Testa. But Testa wasn't someone who would command a room. You know, sure. Salvi, Salvi was, he was a an powerhouse. Sure. Very much an up-and-comer, as you said. Uh, he also uh, elevates Frank Monti to consigliere uh, and Salvatore uh, Merlino to underboss. So uh, he was kind of creating everything. He was the boss now. And this is kind of where the, the floodgates open. I mean, mm -hmm. Scarfo starts installing uh, things that were not really necessarily being installed during Bruno's time. He installs a, a street tax, which yep. you know, was being paid. Any criminal working independent from the mob, whether it was a drug dealer, a bookmaker, a pimp, uh, numbers, whoever, uh, you paid a street tax weekly. Uh, and again, if you didn't pay, if you didn't get down or lay down, uh, you were laid down. Uh, the money was then divided between the guys collecting the tax who got 99% and their capos uh, or boss as well. So everybody got a piece. Uh, and if you didn't play ball, you were murdered. Uh, so people like uh, you know, Steve Boris, who was, who was running the, the Greek, the Greek mob, mob at the time, you know, Harry Riccobini, all these different guys. Uh, if, if you didn't pay uh, and look as the mob would do, if you didn't pay, you died. And that's something that Nikki Scarfo, uh, you know, antithesized. If you yeah, didn't get Bruno, involved, you were gone. The opposite of Bruno. This, Correct. this was cowboy style uh, yep. to the tilt. Um, Nikki loved uh, gangster movies he loved cowboys and Indians. He loved, you know, in your face uh, uh, mob activity. He, he loved, uh, you know, bodies strewn on the street and, and what that would do to, you know, his, his rivals in the sense that, you know, you know, announcing his presence with authority. He came in and in the next five years, he ordered 30 murders in a city and in a mob family that hadn't had. 30 murders in the past 30 years 
yep. and, and he ordered 30 in, in five years. And like you said, you know, the, the, the JBM uh, junior black mafia there popularized the phrase, uh, get down and lay down, but you know, Nikki embodied it uh, with that, with his, with, with, with his regime. Um, and it was, yeah, you know, just controlling all vice on the street, um, not cherry picking the way that Bruno did, getting even deeper and uh, getting even more involved in unions, uh, making alliances with uh, the bikers and the blacks and, you know, seizing power uh, over the Greeks. Like you said, Stevie Boris and, and Harry Pappas, who was one of, I believe it was Harry. Pe no, it was Harry, Pe Harry Petros, I believe. Uh, there was two Greek mob bosses killed in the same week. Uh, Boris and, and, and Petros were killed in the same week in 1982 or 83. And, um, you know, it was a new day. And what what's interesting, and I'll, I'll turn it back over to you to keep the narrative flowing, but what's interesting to me is that at that point uh, in 1981, and we should also say that uh, Harry Rickabini, there's a, another war that breaks out with Harry Rickabini and, and the Rickabini faction um, that, that won't fall in line under, under Scarfo. And Scarfo gives, you know, the, the okay for Salvi test at that point. Okay. He said, you know, you, you just led a, a war against your father's killers. Now you're going to lead the war against the Riccobini faction and, and Salvi and his crew went out there and, and, you know, took it to the streets with, with Riccobini's and ended up winning that war. So he just really, uh, Salvi had, had really, you know, he had shed skin for the family. He was shot in that war uh, against the Riccobini survived a assassination attempt and uh, just was really very loyal to, to, to Nikki Scarfo, and that was representative of the whole family at that point. Nikki had so much potential in terms of becoming a great La Cosa Nostra leader because uh, he had a ton of support from both the OG contingent, the, the old school guys that had been under Bruno and had been dissatisfied, um, came underneath him. The guys that were underneath Capa Negro uh, in, in the failed coup came underneath him. Um, the guys that, you know, weren't purged. Uh, and then all the younger guys, which there was a ton of them, guys that were uh, nephews and sons and cousins uh, of Scarfo's inner circle. So, I mean, he had so much potential for, for building something that, that could have been really, really um, unbreakable. And it slowly eroded uh, because of, him becoming paranoid and, and yep. power drunk. And, you know, he was already violence prone. So you put those three things together. Uh, it was a dangerous recipe. And within three years, um, what could have been this regal flourishing mob empire was, was coming apart at the seams because everyone thought that Scarfo was going to put a contract on their head. Yeah. And by this time, as you said, I mean, he was, they were making a ton of money, but, you know, Nikki had, I mean, there, it was the Wild West in South Philly. I mean, everybody was getting killed. Um, he lost and, his mind. I mean, he literally lost his mind. Yep. Like, no, you're, you're totally He right. was irrational and, uh, you know, just was not rooted in reality. And there was zero checks because at that point, New York was in full support of him. So he would, he would, he would, like I, like I, I talked about earlier where, where, you know, he would hold court. And at these restaurants and at these bars and clubs, and at first it was it was very uh, chummy and benign when the when these when these sessions kind of started in the in the late seventies, early eighties. But by the mid eighties, by eighty three, eighty four, eighty five, he would he would stand up in front of twenty guys in the table and be like, "If you guys don't start, you know, towing the line and acting right, I'm going to bring in a hit crew from New York. I'm going to kill every one of you." Yeah, I'm gonna kill this whole. I'm gonna. He he was threatening to kill the entire family and start from scratch. Yeah, he that, was a real the, lunatic. For yeah, sure. yeah. And he was and he was voicing this to the rank and file. It wasn't <laughs> something that like he was confiding in his consigliere, you know, in the dark of night in the back of a you know back office room. He's announcing this to his his entire family that if you don't start acting right or or doing what I say better. I'm going to kill. I'm gonna. I'm gonna decimate our whole. I'm gonna. I'm gonna genocide our whole family. 
Yeah, he really became a lunatic and even became enraged one time when the media uh, dubbed the organization the gang that couldn't shoot straight because they were shooting so many people that, you know, bullets were going all over the place. They're riddling bullets. They were going after people and they weren't there. There was all sorts of things going on. Uh, it was really a mess down in down in, you know, down in South Philly in the 80s. And yeah, at one point, Nikki goes to jail uh in uh in 19 i believe in 1983 1982 yep. uh comes out uh and nephew philip leonetti's there waiting for him uh he spent the day partying at a hotel and then he flew down as a to, Saudi. as a Saudi. yep they, they fly down to uh you know atlantic city and that's where nikki's kind of at the height of his power they're making a ton of money uh but this is where and as you said this is where the paranoia starts for nikki's car it really had always been uh happening but he becomes to see that Sal Testa's being written about. He's making a ton of money. Uh, he went to war for the family and survived. He was charismatic. He was confident. He was loyal and popular. And he starts to get uh, kind of everything that he had deserved. Sal Testa was a mob guy through and through. And he was yep. liked by a lot of people. And little Nicky Scarfo started seeing that. He also was in a relationship at that point with uh, Merlino, uh, Chucky Merlino's kid, uh, Maria Merlino. Yeah. Um, and you know, they get engaged. Uh, Testa then breaks off the engagement. I guess he gets cold feet. This was April, so this was April of 84. The uh, Nikki gets out of prison in 84 January or February of 84. There's that famous news footage of, of uh, him be, uh, landing in the, in the airport and yeah. being uh, chauffeured or, or uh, you know, flanked, if you will by uh, his nephew, Philip and Salvi. Salvi's wearing a cowboy hat that he had got down in Texas because that's where they went and picked up Nikki from. Um, and fast forward two months to April and Salvi Testa breaks off the engagement with, with Maria Merlino. And that really kind of enrages uh, Nikki Scarfo, as did other things. Well, I think uh, he, I think he used it as an excuse. I don't think he right, really gave no, it. I don't I, think he really I, gave it. I think Chucky, I think Chucky really don't gave a shit because he was embarrassed. Right. And, and he used and, it as an as an excuse right. that Testa had to go at that point. Right. I, I think you're totally right. Uh now again, Testa was, you know, a guy you went around. He was a growing, he he really made you into what you were, I think, in a way. Uh, and he and loved he, Nikki. He loved yeah. Nikki. There was no from from everyone I've spoken to, and I've spoken to probably a dozen people. Uh, that knew Salvi on a firsthand basis, probably a half dozen of those guys, I would say, were in Salvi's inner circle. And they all say to a T, Salvi loved Nikki. Salvi loved everything Nikki was about. There was no way, shape, or form in any universe where Salvi Testa would have turned on Nikki and tried to undermine Nikki. All he wanted to do was serve Nikki and be loyal to Nikki. And because like you said, he started to get some attention from the press. And I mean, look at the guy was good looking. Yeah. He was, like you said, he was magnetic and he was the, you know, the, the, the Holy, I call it the Holy Trinity in, in organized crime circles. And this is organized crime. Uh, if you're Italian, Jewish, Irish, black, Mexican, the Holy Trinity loved, feared, respected. And it's hard to get all those three. Uh, yeah, the crazy and, thing and, about Nikki Scarfo, and I, I just want to kind of interject. The crazy thing about Nikki yeah. Scarfo is, if he had just played by the rules, Nick, uh, T Sal Testa would have waited on him hand and foot. He would have yep. played the game the right way. Nikki would have went deep into his life. He was the boss, you know, made a ton of money. He would pass away, and 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 you know, Testa would probably take over as long as you know. Testa and, and, Testa and Leonetti would have taken over if yeah. they. But they, but well, and then the, the murder of Testa, I think, was the final straw for everybody, including Leonetti. Yeah, right. And you hear the story about Leonetti, you know, saying something uh, about uh, there, there are some people that question Phillips' sincerity when he says that he was upset by Salvi's murder because there was a, uh, a, a conversation that was relayed by Nikki Crow. Uh, in his book, where, where Philip allegedly said, you know, can we just kill this guy already? I'm sick of seeing his face. And I think that was totally taken out of context. And I'm not, you know, I'm not denying he might have said something like that, but I don't think it was like, I'm tired of seeing his face. I can't hand, I can't stand this guy. It was more like, my uncle is making us kill this guy. I love this guy. I can't believe we're doing this, mm -hmm. but we have to do it. So let's just get it over with. 
Yeah, no, I think you're totally right. It, and and that kind of was at the point in April, Scarfo made his mind up and uh, unwilling to, to listen to reason, he decides that Sal Testa has to go. The problem that they would have in this hit was Sal Testa was a hit man himself. He yep. knew kind of kind of the tricks of, of how it all worked. And he was cautious. He wasn't going to, you know, just show up somewhere like a, like a Vincent Falcone would, it was going to be difficult. And uh, Nikki Scarfo assigned kind of the best people to do it. He assigns Nikki Caramonte and a, a, a guy named uh, Charles I each to the, to the hit, uh, but Charlie he would need White, other R. people R. as well. R.I.P. Charlie White. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He would need other people though, as well. And he would need friends of, of, of Testa to help out. Joey Pungitor yep. uh, was involved. Salvatore Grandi was involved. Everyone was kind of involved. And they basically lure uh, Nikki, uh, or uh, sorry, Salvi Testa to a, a store on South Street. Uh, and at, at that point, uh, he turns uh, to talk to Joey It was a candy shop that yep. they ran a book out of. Yep, yep. They, uh, they're they all in there. Salvi turns his back to Joey Punch to talk to Joey Punch. And Wayne Grandi takes a gun out and, and shoots him in the back of the head. Um, punch, was, punch was his best friend Salvi and Joey Punch were were uh, as thick as thieves and um, you know that if 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 there's anything that can really paint a picture of how ruthless uh, the mafia is and and in organized crime and, and perf- you know when we're talking about professional hits um, and I think Henry Hill or the Henry Hill character in Goodfellas said it the best, you know, when they, when, when they, when they put a contract on your head, it's your best friend that's coming to carry it out. It ain't, it ain't the, the scary boogie, you know, the boogeyman, uh, you know, hitman that you don't know. It, it's, 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 it's the devil you do know. It's not the devil that you don't know. So, you know, Joey Punge was put in a situation where he had to whack out his best friend. Yeah. And, and you know, you always kind of wonder, I've always wondered this, you know, maybe if, you know, and I'll ask you because you you know Philip Leonetti pretty well. I mean, wrote his book. If at this point, if 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 Salvi Testa and Joey Ponge and all these young guys, let's say they go to Philip and say, or Phil, would, do you ever think Philip at that point would say, you know what, you're out of hand, Nikki. Uh, yeah, you're my you're my uncle, but you know you got to go. No, I think that's where things were trending. Um, I think that if the indictment hadn't have dropped in, I believe it was March of 87 and everyone got picked up. I believe if there had been no arrests um, or indictments that spring, I I believe by the summer of 87, Philip would have organized his own coup and would have killed Phil, would have killed his uncle and maybe even had retired and, and handed the reins to someone else. Cause at that point, Philip was very jaded and, and really didn't want to be a part of, of organized crime anymore. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think there's any way that if things had been going in the direction that they were going in, that, that Scarfo would have survived uh, in terms of a, a, a revolution. There would have been, there would have been a revolt and, Philip told me this himself. Like I was planning on killing my uncle. <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't think anyone will blame him. Uh, so they yeah. kill uh, Salvi Testa. But you, but you give an, you give an interesting scenario there. I, I don't know. And I, maybe this did happen. I don't know. I, it would be interesting to, to, if you could play that, you know, what if history game. Yeah. If Salvi that summer of 84, where he knew that there had been a contract on his head, and you know they stalked him that whole summer. They weren't they weren't able to get him until September. Um, if if Salvi would have gone to Philip and been like, "Hey man, let's let's join forces and get rid of your crazy fucking uncle," <laughs> you gotta take, wonder. Take this I thing mean, over ourselves. And what Philip's? I, I, part of me thinks Philip would have been on board with it. I, I agree, and I feel like as you said, I think Philip had become kind of uh, jaded with the life at any rate, and said, "Look, I, I'm I'm done with this. You know, you do what you have to do." Uh, I'm out. I'm going to, I'm going to shelve myself. You could take over. Uh, and, and you got to wonder where the, the family would have went, because I think at that point, you know, John Stanford would have never came across. Who, who knows? Who knows what would happen? But it, it is a fascinating question. They dumped Salvi's remains on a dirt road in Gloucester Township, New Jersey. And by that point, 
um, you know, they, they, they do away with him. He's done. Uh, that same year, Nikki and uh, Phil Leonetti did all sorts of things. They were still making money. They were still doing things. Philip uh, and Nikki were spending a lot of time down in Florida and Atlantic City. By 1985, Scarfo becomes a target. Look, he had been a target, but he was a target of the New Jersey State Police in a major gambling investigation. Um, Nikki never talked business on the phone, so the wiretaps weren't really uh, used. Uh, but, you know, again, there were still murders going on. There were all sorts of things going on. Uh, by 1985, though, and this is where kind of it gets really bad for Nikki Scarfo. Uh, Nikki plots to basically there's a a contract in Penn's Landing in Philadelphia. The the city wanted to revive the the waterfront, and a commercial developer, uh, Willard Rouse, basically uh, wants the contract. He wants to make the the the, the Penn's Landing a, a, a tourist spot, and and ends it up today. It, it is a beautiful place to go. Uh, Nikki sends uh, Nick Caramondi to go speak to, to Willard Rouse. Uh, he offers him a million dollars. He basically asks for a million dollars to uh, fix the bid for, for Rouse. Rouse gets spooked and contacts the FBI. Uh, and at that point, the FBI sends in an undercover agent uh, and they get uh, Nikki uh, Caramondi uh, jammed up in this whole thing. Uh, he's indicted for his role in an extortion case in 1986. Uh, and by that point, the, the the thread is ending on on Nikki yeah. Scarfo. That was kind of the end, right? Yeah. So uh, when Nikki Crow and Tommy Dell flipped, um, that was really all she wrote. Those were two uh, mob capos that were, um, you know, helping run, if not running Philadelphia. You got to remember that uh, Nikki was during his his reign was still based out of Atlantic City and had and Chucky Merlino, who was his best friend and underboss, was the, you know, for all intents and purposes, was the street boss and was in charge of Philadelphia. Uh, Chucky and Nikki had a falling out in 86, the end of 85, 86. Uh, Chucky Merlino had, had become a, um, he was drinking a lot and getting out of kind of getting out of control with some of his behavior while he was drinking. I think he had a, a, a DUI where he tried to bribe a police officer. He had a run in with the pagans where he you know, took his Mercedes and rammed it into a bunch of pagans motorcycles when he was drunk. Uh, and Nikki shelved Chucky. And that's when he promoted Leonetti to underboss. But Leonetti was with Nikki in Atlantic city. So at that point, Philadelphia was under the auspice of um, or under the control of Tommy Dell, uh, uh, Fancy Signer, uh, sorry, Fan, Fanny, sorry, sorry. Uh, um, uh, uh, what, Faffy, 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 yeah, I don't fan, I'm Faffy, Faffy Inarella and uh, uh, Nikki Crow and Charlie and, and Charlie White. So those four guys were, were running Philly and uh, two of them flipped, at, you know, so it's a rat man they they can they could attest to all of the bribery all of the shakedowns all of the murders um so tommy dell and nikki crow flipped charlie white and and faffy uh went down with the ship uh the charlie and faffy both got out uh, of prison um in the last 10 15 years charlie just charlie white just died faffy is uh back in the mix and you know depending on who you talk to it was either you know, involved or retired. <laughs> yeah. And, and as you said, in 1986, around that time, Caramani's indicted, everybody's indicted. And, uh, you know, that's the end for Nikki Scarfo between 87 and 89 Scarfo was convicted three different times for conspiracy, racketeering murder, and was sentenced initially to 14 years. Then he got 55 years. Then he got life. Although the life sentence was later overturned. Uh, and, he had to thank uh, people like Nick Caramondi, who was uh, kind of the uh, integral part of all that. Uh, and Tommy, Dell, Tom, Tommy Dell and Nikki Crow were the star witnesses. Correct. And Nikki was convicted in the Court of Common Pleas in 1989 for the first degree murder uh, of Frank uh, the Flower, uh, Frankie Flowers de Alfonso, Frank who was actually killed on, uh, on 12th and Shunk, I believe. He was also uh, with six of his lieutenants. Uh, they all tested it against him, whether it was Gino Milano, whether it was Lawrence Molino, whether it was, uh, you know, uh, Caramondi. They all they all testified against him. Yeah. So, yeah, Yogi Merlino ended up 
uh, jumping ship. That was uh, Chucky Merlino's brother, Lawrence Merlino. They call the Yogi. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, he had a lot of people taking the witness stand at that point. Um, Gina Milano ended up flipping. And uh, what's interesting about that is that case ended up taking down Phil Narducci, Chicky Narducci's son, and Uncle Joe Legambi, who, according to the federal government, was the uh, day-to-day acting boss of the Philadelphia mob for 20 years, uh, from you know around 2000 to, to around 2020, and um, they uh, they were convicted in that in that hit. Uh, Legambi as a shooter, mm-hmm. but then fast forward almost a decade later, the case got tossed. And there was a retrial and um, they were acquitted, acquitted of it. So uh, both Narducci and Legambi, you know, get a second lease on life and, you know, have been um, been out of prison and, and are uh, still out of prison. Now, by 89, Scarfa, six years old, the 55 year sentence is basically life in prison. Uh, he would still attempt to run the family uh, in uh, in prison in, in 1986. Uh or sorry, in 1989, uh, this is where you can comment. Uh, Philip Leonetti decides in 1989 to uh, testify as well to avoid a 45-year prison sentence uh, and basically spill his guts, uh, which you know intimately. Yeah, and, one thing, quick, and it wasn't just it wasn't just Nikki; it was you know Gotti as well. Yep, sure, exactly. Philip Leonetti was, from what people will say, was a star witness, uh, and he has detailed that in. Scott's book, Mafia Prince. Uh, also, though, some cautionary tales. During uh, the trial, uh, Nicky Scarfo had several sons. One of his sons, uh, Mark, yeah. uh, attempt, attempted suicide during the trial. Uh, Mark, at that point, was 17 years old. He was getting a lot of uh, bullying, taunting in, 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 uh, in school. He, according to people, uh, Nicky wanted him to go into the life, and the kid didn't want to. The kid wanted to do other things, and he was very despondent over the the possible imprisonment and all that kind of stuff. Uh, He attempts to hang himself uh, in 1988 at 17. He suffers cardiac arrest and deprived of oxygen. And until 2014, he lived in he lived in a coma. He was in a coma. Uh, He died in 2014, and it was really kind of you don't ever we don't ever really talk about the people involved in the mob that yep. aren't involved in the mob, people like Mark people Scarfo. That are, yep. Yeah, r- the ripple effects to the people that are connected to the sure. people, family-wise and friendship-wise and uh, that are that are connected to the people that are in the mob. And especially when you're talking about families, I mean, I see it every day in my reporting, um, interacting with family members of both victims, family members, and, you know, mob figures, family members, you know, the accused, if you will, or the convicted. And, you know, if you, if you're a, and you don't, you don't get to pick who your parents are. No, you don't get, you don't get to pick who your uncle is or who your grandfather is. And, you know, I, I can, I can talk a little bit from, um, you know, a little bit of personal experience. Uh, my great uncle was, was, uh, via marriage. My great uncle via marriage was murdered. Um, in a Detroit mob hit in 1971. I never got to meet him, but, you know, I obviously heard a lot of, a lot of stories about that. And my, uh, you know, my grandfather was a, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say he was a mobster, but I would say he was a, uh, you know, a mob associate, a Jewish uh, gambler that hung around with all of the big time Jewish wise guys in Detroit. And, you know, these guys were just my grandpa's buddies, but then you realize that, you know, some of these guys are, 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 are suspected murderers or, uh, you know, suspected, uh, uh, of, of pretty vile things. And then, you know, you, you think about those people that, you know, and, and their, their daughters and their sons, and they have to read about the stuff in the paper and they have to, you know, live it. And it, and it really has nothing, you know, it has nothing to do with them other than the fact that that's who their relative is. Yeah. And, and some people just try to kind of brush it under the carpet and just kind of try to live their own life. But some like Mark Scarfo and look, even if you, you know, if you're familiar with like Roy DeMeo, he had a son, Albert DeMeo, and he, he wrote mm-hmm. a book about his life and how, you know, his whole life he's had to live with the fact of what his father did. And yeah, a, a lot of, there, there's a lot of cautionary tales 
that you know there are usually when your your father or uncles in the mob or whoever people just kind of assume because they did it you're going to do it and you know mm-hmm. if you look at Nikki's son Nikki Jr. I mean, he went into the mob and he went into that kind of life and he's currently in prison. But um, yeah, Nikki is a, is a, is a lunatic. And I, I kind of want to end it with kind of my thoughts on Nikki, but real mm-hmm. quick, uh, Nikki served a sentence uh, at uh, USP Atlanta. Uh, he was then transferred uh, to uh, FMC Butner in North Carolina, where he died of natural causes in 2017. Uh, Nikki tried to, to beat it out. Uh, he died, uh, uh, at uh, basically, I mean, he was very old. I think he was 87 when he died. Yeah, uh, lived pretty long um, and had a can wild I, life. Uh, yeah, I, can I just can I add two uh, postscripts to the? Yeah, to I, my, I do want my analysis I, of Nikki Scarf real quick. I want you to share if you can. Can you share the story about Nikki's reaction about yeah, your book? So, right. So there's there's two things there's two things I want to tell listeners that one thing I'm sure they don't know and one thing they might not know or they might know. Uh, first is. You know, Nikki, like we talked about Salvi being La Cosa Nostra through and through to, you know, at the cellular level. So was Nikki Scarfo. Um, even though he was locked up the last 30 years of his life, he, he was someone that that was still trying to be involved as much as he could um, with La Cosa Nostra and was intent on reclaiming the Philadelphia mob family, like up until... 10 years ago, <laughs> into the 2000s and 2010s, um, his son, Nicky Jr., ended up getting busted in this big uh, bank scam, and they ended up ripping this bank off for, I don't know the numbers, but you know millions of dollars. And if you read the court documents, Nicky was intending on taking the money from this scam and buying his way back to the top of the Philadelphia mob by, by giving this money to the Lucchese family in New York and arranging for the current mob players in Philadelphia to be murdered. And then he was going to install his son as the boss and he was going to be running the, the show from in prison. I mean, that's how unrooted from reality Nicky Scarfo was in the, in the last years of his life, that, that he's living this alternative universe where he could have somehow pulled that off, which again speaks to what a lunatic. Nikki was, uh, and I think if you know, obviously by listening to this and and, and going into everything, Nikki was a lunatic. He was a psychopath. He was one of the biggest uh, nuts in the history of organized crime. And I want to quickly, you told me a story about when Nikki and and you yeah. you connected this to you know you got uh, info for, straight from the the prison about this. Right. About when Nikki and and let's keep in mind, once Nikki found out that Philip Leonetti snitched, and to this day Philip Leonetti doesn't show his face. He's still right. worried about it. Uh, what did he do when he found out about this book? That so first, Nikki found out that Philip was writing a book, and we knew that he was upset by that. Um, uh, Philip had considered writing the book in the 1990s, right after he flipped. Um, with George Anastasia and then just the project fizzled. Um, so book gets released. Uh, there was a big marketing push right off the bat with it. And um, in the front of the book, Philip dedicates the book to Nikki, but in a, in an underhanded way, basically saying, you know, I want to dedicate this to you. You taught me all about uh, the life and, and what it means. And, you know, look at you and look at me pretty much saying like, I, know, I, I didn't listen to you and I got out and I'm living my best life now. And you're stuck there for the rest of your life. You know, pretty much you're going to get, you're going to die buried underneath the prison. It was a real fuck you, frankly, to, from, to, to Scarfo. So Scarfo ordered the book in prison. He gets it sent to him. Um, this was in 2000 and uh, fall of 2012, I believe. Um, and he got it and he was, I heard he was uh, in the, either in the yard or in the um, in the area where they congregate, where the, uh, where the, where the television is, uh, uh, you know, in the uh, kind of rec area of the prison. And the, he looked at the book and he read the inscription and he had a heart attack. I mean, he literally had a heart attack. Couldn't believe uh, it. Within 10 seconds of picking up my book. He was absolutely and, uh, incensed. W- was in the hospital in Butner um, for, uh, 
a, a good couple months recovering from that. So, so you feel like you gave Nikki a scarf a heart attack? Yeah, I mean, I think me and Philip both think that that just reading that inscription and you know you'd heard about the book, but actually getting the physical copy of the book in his hands with a picture of him and Philip on the cover and knowing that, or at least thinking in his mind that Philip was was you know capitalizing off of this, and he was. Um, but in terms of you know financials, I think that people have a a very different idea of how much you get paid to write something like that. You know, people think you, you get a book in Barnes and Noble, you're, you're rich. And that's not necessarily the case. But, I think you got to put that in your Twitter bio. Once gave Nikki Scarfo. Yeah. Once time. gave Nikki Scarfo a coronary. Uh, yeah. But all in all, um, I think we always try to, you know, in our first episode, we tried to kind of tie, we always try to tie the episode back to, to normality. And look, yeah. at the end of the day, Nikki Scarfo was a lunatic. I think as we kind of uncovered in this show, if Nicky Scarfo had just played by the rules, which I think up until he became boss, he yeah, did. Yep. Uh, right. That's enough. my point. Uh, that this, that when I said that he became paranoid and power drunk, yeah. uh, he didn't really show other than the fact that he had a hair trigger temper and people knew that um, and had a little, and had a, a Napoleon complex. I mean, people knew now, that. Would he and, been... that he was, that he, and that he was a killer, but the, the notion that he would go off the rails, the way he went off the rails, there was really nothing in his history that would have led you to believe that other than the one incident he had, you know, uh, at the Oregon diner. But I don't think that could have foreshadowed or, or, or gave anyone an inclination that when he would become boss, he, you know, he would become uh, for all intents and pur- purposes, a serial killer. Yeah. I don't think anyone thought it. And look, ultimately, um, you know, Salvi dies, uh, Philip, uh, goes into the witness protection program. Murder's uh, a way of life. In, murder's a way of life in the mob, but you know, yep. then that's a fact. But there are people that do it because it's business, and then there are people that do it uh, for pleasure. Just to and, do it, and, right? And Nikki was doing it for pleasure, and that—that's what was so disturbing. Yeah, he was a disturbing guy. Uh, Scott Bernstein, great stuff. Uh, Nikki, uh, definitely not the greatest boss in the world, but definitely a fascinating guy nonetheless. Uh, by the way, uh, you, you still talk to Philip uh, Leonetti? What, what's he been up? To? Uh, you know, we're in contact. I mean, we're not. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that we're best friends, but uh, I got nothing but respect for the guy. I owe him, you know, I, I owe him and George my, you know, a, a lot of my career because they they co-signed me. Um, they validated me uh, by letting me write his book. He allowed me. It was kind of like a punching my ticket to be able to write about Philadelphia um, after that. Um, so, you know, Philip's a incredibly intelligent, um, well-spoken. And the, the best thing I have to say about Philip, and I think this really – this is how I want to end this episode or on my end. What, what I can say about Philip, and I can't say this about literally any other high ranking mob figure that I've ever been associated with. And I've literally sat down with dozens, uh, including uh, a handful of La Cosa Nostra bosses, you know, guys that were bosses of crime families. Um, and Philip was, was obviously an underboss. And every single one of them, except for Philip, longs for their former life. And if you gave them a choice um, that they could go back and do it all over again, they'd do it in a second. And there's nothing about Philip that fits that mold. Philip is genuinely happy to be a regular schnook. And I use the line from Goodfellas where Henry Hill says, you know, I'm just I, I, I live like a like an like a like a nobody in a in a nobody town. When I ask for yeah. uh, spaghetti and, and gravy, I get egg, egg noodles, noodles and ketchup. ketchup. I'm just a regular schnook. And Philip loves being a regular schnook. And I and that I admire that in him because he said, you know, he's like I, I love he this is him me uh, recounting what he said to me. I love being able to just take my wife out for dinner and a movie and we're and a walk. And and take my kid out to the golf course for 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 uh, for a round, and just be able to live a normal life. There's nothing about my former life that I that I want to recapture or, or relive. I I like to be a normal guy living a living a normal boring life. When like I'm telling you, uh, the opposite of that would be Ralph Natale, uh, who was the the boss of Philadelphia in the. Um, in the 1990s, who I, I spent a, a good deal of time with. And, you know, Ralph, and I say this all due respect to Ralph, because I, 
I like Ralph and Ralph has been really good to me and I got nothing negative to say about Ralph on a personal level, but I will say that, you know, Ralph is a legend in his own mind and, and Ralph wants to be Ralph Natale circa 1995, not Ralph Natale circa 2020. Gotcha. There's nothing about Philip that wants to be quote unquote crazy Phil Leonetti circa 1986. According to Philip, he's at peace. Uh, I got to ask yep. you real quick before we go. Yep. Do you believe that story? Uh, and I want to set the stage real quick. There's a story that w- w- was going around that Nikki one time went horseback riding. Yeah. And w- whether you believe it or not, he went horseback riding. And the horse, I guess, in his deranged lunatic personality, he got bucked off the horse, basically. And they were on some sort of like cliffside and Nikki became so enraged that he pushed the horse off the hill. Do you believe that? Is that? Yeah, I believe it. Is that truthful? Yes, I believe it is. I mean, that kind of incenses who Nikki is. That's how unhinged he was. And he, he was, um, he, he was, he was living on another planet. I mean, the, the, the Philip told me about this is when Philip was the underboss and it'd be three o'clock in the morning and Nikki would be calling him in the middle of the night. To, to call a plumber for him. And then the plumber didn't, you know, didn't get there in time. So he called Philip and said, I'll cancel that plumber and hire another plumber. And it's like three o'clock in the morning. And Philip's like, Oh, well, what, what do you, why, why are you, why are you making me do this? I'm your underboss. I'm, I mean, well, why are we having these conversations right now? And, you know, there's a thousand other people that can do this. And he's like, well, you're the only one I trust. Yeah. And then it's like, that's the type of like paranoia <laughs> it's the kind of craziness that that you're dealing with and uh the one thing that another thing that really stuck out to me when philip was talking about nikki and when nikki would talk about how you keep power you know he would say just kill 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 just keep killing i mean he would vocalize this he's like that's the only way you keep power a total so just psychopath yeah. in every a sense ca- of the it's word. A really a caught you said it's a really it's a cautionary tale um for what someone that wasn't necessarily a lunatic not to say that he was of sound mind before this but i don't think he was quite at at the at the level of sociopathy that he reached and you know how you know power can go to someone's head and 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 become so detrimental uh that that you you become a cancer to society (laughs) yeah a total lunatic in every sense of the word nikki scarfo uh, on the sit down scott bernstein great stuff very detailed as always uh you can find uh, scott bernstein uh on the gangster report at uh gangsterreport.com a great website that keeps Thanks, track Frank. of uh daily uh, gangster uh, news you can also check out his book on philip Linetti and the philadelphia mob uh, mafia prince you can get it on amazon it's a great book and also make sure you catch scott on white boy which is uh currently live on netflix one of the great documentaries you'll find on there right now in fact could be the hottest documentary uh in the streets right now uh, also Thanks, check buddy. yeah no problem check scott out on twitter at b-u-r-n-e-y-s tweets bernsey's tweets i'll tag bernie's in the, bernie uh, bernie's tweets bernie's tweets sorry yeah you're right yeah, sorry uh we'll uh, make and sure then we tag that and i also want to uh let everyone know that my podcast called the original gangsters podcast yeah. aka the og um, launched in 2009 on the CBS Intercom platform, which is now called Odyssey. We were named top 10 true crime podcasts by Time Magazine and Radio.com in 2019. Unfortunately, in 2020, we had to go dormant. Uh, and We've been uh, sitting idle for about eight months, and we're on the verge of relaunching. So watch for that. Original Gangsters podcast, wherever you wherever – you, uh, consume your podcast will be uh 10 fresh new that we had 25 episodes we did um between uh, 2019 and the first half of 2020 um and we're going to come back uh you know a gangbusters here uh uh letting everyone know that the og podcast hasn't gone anywhere we got 10 fresh new episodes that will be dropping in the next couple of weeks we'll look forward to it scott bernstein as always great stuff i always enjoy talking to you and uh thanks for coming on today Thanks, Jeff. I really appreciate it, buddy. No problem. As always, uh, you can find us on Twitter at the Sit Down Seven. Uh, this has been the Sit Down. It's Nikki Scarfo. Next week, very good show as well. We're going to talk about. 
the mafia cops, Louis Eppolito and Stephen Caracapa, two of the most corrupt uh, people in law enforcement in the history of this country. We'll talk about them. Uh, thanks, as always, to Scott Bernstein for coming on. I am Jeff Nadu. Uh, we will see you next week here on The Sit Down, a crime and mafia podcast.